Royal Dessert Sour, directed by Rudy Valley. Tonight's headliner, Sir Cedric Hardwick. This is Rudy Valley and Company. Among the ingredients we have mixed, stirred and strained, bottled in jars for your delectation this evening are a borax slalom, a glass of Royal Amontillado Chirero 1851, a rain barrel and a windowsill, a Beethoven processional, a cone whose dimensions approach infinity, a dancing dragon, a roast guinea hen, a hotel in the Catskills, a faraway look, a bonnet of blue and a silver flute. Listen closely and see if you can pick them out as they go by. With Sir Cedric Hardwick, star of Shadow and Substance, heading the richly varied procession. In order of appearance, the principal mem members of our cast include... Fred Keating, Sir Cedric Hardwick, Tommy Riggs, Betty Lou Barry, Irving Caesar, Johnny and George, Helen Howe, and those never-changing Connecticut Yankees. medley, that faraway look in your eye, lost and found. There's a faraway look in your eye, you're dreaming of something, what can it be? There's a faraway look in your eye You seem to be spellbound What is it you see? If I knew, dear, just exactly where I stand I'd worry no more If I knew, dear, even though you hold my hand Just whom you adore Oh, there's a faraway look in your eye You're dreaming of someone Please say that it's I. Item number two, Fred Keating, who used to be a magician. So good a magician was Mr. Keating that he was able to perform the astounding feat of changing himself into, first, a comedian, second, a leading man for numerous charming ladies of the stage and screen. Here's Fred and his contribution. Item number two. Welcome back, Fred. I hope you feel that my feeble attempts at an introduction did you justice. Well, frankly, Rudy, I found them a little disconcerting. Your uh, reference to me as an item, for instance. Well, that lends itself to some very questionable interpretations. Uh, an egg beater or a slightly used percolator top. After all, an item is just an item, a, a thing. You know, next on our program, we have here a thing. You know, any old thing. Fred, I'm sorry if I... Oh, spare the crocodile tears, Rudy. It's, uh, it's quite all right, really. It's... Uh, it's only that people may not quite know what to expect. They, uh, they might think I'm a new way to open a can or uh, something that kills ants. But, but when I called you an item, Fred, I didn't stop to think. I might just as easily call myself an item. <laughs> That's awfully sporting of you, Rudy, but 
You are, you are hardly the item type, are you? You, uh, you are more of the box top offer. You know, send in four box tops and get Rudy Valley in a plain wrapper. Or do you wear one of those silk affairs with all the dragons doing the big apples? Well, Fred, whatever I said, I assure you there was nothing in my mind that... My... I never had thought there was anything in your mind. I... <laughs> I mean, I mean that remark of yours, Rudy, that's, uh, that's a little redundant. Redundant? Yeah, uh, well, of course, you'd hardly understand. You went to Yale, that's, uh... <laughs> that is a Harvard word. But the point is, Rudy, I don't mind being called an item so much as when you spoke of my contribution to the program. What's wrong with that? You are making a contribution to the program, aren't you? Yeah, well, meaning that I don't get paid? <laughs> not, uh, not that I'm avaricious, Rudy. But after all, for what I'm going to do for you this evening, even you would agree that no price would be too great. Because, Rudy, I have decided that it's about time you got the break you so richly deserve. Every time I listen to you on the radio, I suffer. I suffer because I hear you doling out opportunities to other people and taking nothing for yourself. And, Rudy, through your generosity, through your kindness and self-sacrifice, many of these people have become rich and famous. And you, look at you. <laughs> there you are, plodding on week after week, interviewing other people, plugging them, letting them talk about themselves. And probably, probably all of your life, Rudy, you wanted to talk about yourself and... Nobody would listen to you. <laughs> so tonight, tonight, I am going to give you that opportunity. Why, well, that, that's more than generous, Fred. And I'd be glad After to... all, Rudy, you see, you must remember that you are still one of the very few remaining American institutions. You and the aquarium. <laughs> and I've heard that pretty soon they're going to tear that down, too. <laughs> In other words, I think that it's about time that you were preserved. I mean that you, the inner Rudy, were brought out. And so, on behalf, not only of myself, but also of the great American public, there are a few vital questions concerning yourself that I should like to ask you. One in particular. Certainly, Fred. What's that? Uh, when did you first decide to do your hair that way? <laughs> well, now, let's see. Rather, I... rather, Rudy, what I am driving at is, will you tell us in a few simple and well-chosen words just how you started out in life? I started out as a saxophone player. I know, but that's hardly conclusive. You see, what, what interests us is the impulse that first made you want to blow into a saxophone. And why a saxophone? Were you, um, were you fascinated by its graceful lines and all those shiny buttons and things? Or, exactly, exactly. Uh, or was it that you just liked the idea of going through life with something hanging around your neck? <laughs> of course, there's one thing about a saxophone, you don't have to pay it any alimony. But, uh, <clears throat> but I'll admit that the one that you're wearing now is very becoming, Rudy. Of course, uh, after all, most people prefer neckties. Or don't you like neckties? Of course I like neckties, especially You see, that... Rudy, you've got to remember... <laughs> you've got to remember that it's a scientific fact that the saxophone does provoke some kind of an impulse in everybody. But not always that uncontrollable urge to blow into it. Now, my impulse, for instance, is not to listen to it. Irresistibly. But what I am trying to do, Rudy, is to get you to explain to bring out the, the particular influence that the saxophone has had upon your life. Uh, what we might call the uh, psychopathological or morbid effect. Of course, that doesn't include meals saved in room, which is 25 cents extra. <laughs> and so, if you will tell us roughly, not uh, too roughly, of course, at what age did you first become involved with this instrument? Well, the truth is, Fred, I first became interested in the sax when I was very young. Very young. How, uh, how young was that? Well, so long ago, I can hardly remember. Although, weaned on a saxophone, huh? <laughs> sort of a, a sort of a problem child, something like Betty Lou, I imagine. <laughs> and by the way, I uh, I wonder what Betty Lou will be like when Tommy Riggs grows up. <laughs> but Rudy, Rudy, in other words, when you first saw the saxophone, you felt that there was something to be overcome. In other words, you saw, you blew, you conquered. Now, will you tell me, do you attribute your success to the fact that you picked up a saxophone or laid it down? Well, I'll tell you that... And uh, another thing I noticed... <laughs> Rudy, that thus far in our little chat, you have failed to make any mention of the Connecticut Yankees. Now, I happen to know that these boys have worked very hard for years to drown you out and finally forced you to leave the band. So wouldn't you care to tell us something about them? Well, you see, the Connecticut oh, Yankees, I, especially I, the brass... I, <laughs> the brass, I beg your pardon, Rudy, but I didn't realize it was so late we... We've got so much to do tonight. 
And I want to thank you for coming up here this evening and being so frank. I... I'd be glad to have you again sometime. I'm sure that we've enjoyed your story. It certainly takes all kinds of people to make a town like this New York, and we should like to hear more about you, but unfortunately, the show must go on. Thank you, Rudy, and good night. And, oh, uh, before you leave, may I have the uh, baton, please? Thanks again, and uh, I wonder if you'd mind the, the saxophone. If, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have, just, uh, you have just heard one of America's most interesting personalities. Item number two and a half, <laughs> Mr. Rudy Valley. And now my boys will play for you the Tiger Rag. That'll be all, Rudy. You may go now. <laughs> That was our Mr. Valley on the clarinet. Now that June is here, everybody's saying, let's have ice cream for the According to your letters, so many of you seem to enjoy a little Irish-English novelty presented several weeks ago. Phil the fluter's ball that we're going to represent it tonight. This is our version of this little hit that has been a very popular tune in England. Phil the fluter's ball.
Have you heard the fill the flute to from the town of Ballymook? The times are going hard with him. In fact, the man with Brooks, so he just sent out a notice to his neighbors one and all as how he'd like their company that evening at a bar. When right now he was careful to suggest to them that if they found a hat of his convenient to the door, the more they put in whenever he requested them, the better would the music be for dancing on the floor with the tube on the flute. The fiddle of the fiddle, yo, hopping in the middle like a heron on the griddle, yo, up, down, a hand around, across into the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety it filled? the fluted bar. There was Mr. Dennis Dougherty who kept the running dog. A little crooked paddy from the terror locked bog. There were girls from every barony and boys from every art. And the beautiful Miss Brady's with a private horse and cart. Along with them came the bouncing Mrs. Cafferty. Little Mickey Mulligan was also the four. Rose Suzanne, Margaret O'Rafferty, the flower of Adam Gullion and the pride of Perth Revore. With the tube on the flute, the fiddle of the fiddle, yo, hopping in the middle like a heron on the grill, yo, up, down, a hand around, across into the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety it filled the flute? Ball. Then little Mickey Mulligan got up to take a bow. Then the widow Cafferty gets up to show them how I could dance you off your legs, so she is sure as you were born. If you'll only have the pipe play, the hair was in the corn. The fiddle played up to the best of his ability. The lady and the gentleman began to do the share. Faith and Mick, it's you that has agility. Big out of Mrs. Cafferty, you're leaping like a hare with a tooth on the flute. The fiddle of the fiddle, you're hopping in the middle like a hare on the grill. Yo, up, down, a hand around, across into the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety it filled the fluted ball? Fill the flute to tip to wink to little crooked pat. I think it's nearly time to see for passing on the hat. So Paddy passed the carbon round and looking mighty cute. Says you got to pay the piper when he tooth is on the flute. Then all joined in with the grotesque joviality. Covering the buckle, the shuffle and the cut. Jigs were danced of the very finest quality. But the widow beat the company and handled in the foot with the tooth on the flute. The fiddle of the fiddle, yo, hopping in the middle like a heron on the grill, yo. Up, down, a hand around, a cross into the wall. Oh, hadn't we the gaiety? At fill the flute <laughs> Sir Cedric Hardwick in the Shape of Darkness by Milton Geiger. Currently much occupied in playing the proud and haughty Canon Skerritt in Shadow and Substance, Sir Cedric is rated with Morris Evans and John Gilgood as England's most cherished gift to the Broadway stage. Moviegoers will remember him principally, I think, as the bishop in Les Miserables. Supporting Sir Cedric tonight are George Gall and Don Cameron. Sir Cedric Hardwick in The Shape of Darkness. <laughs> A dinner table, elaborately set. Subdued light barely illuminates the beauty of silver and linen. Two men are dining. The man with his back to the wall is stolid and grim. In contrast, the other man is slender, quick of movement. His large, thoughtful eyes shine with an almost unnatural brilliance that seems to light his sensitive, intellectual face. There is always the suggestion of a smile on his lips as he speaks, gaily and sometimes eagerly, always with faint irony. What magnificent soup, James. I was a little skeptical about onion soup in barbarous America, but this is really excellent. I don't know. There isn't much taste to it. Well, a dash of Hockheimer might have given it just the right zest. Of course, it might not be quite the soup we had in the Rupigal that first time. Well, then everything seemed better, even fool, when I was with Celeste. Yes, your wife was a very beautiful woman, Hillary. Sometimes I think you weren't really at fault. But then again, a man's a fool for being a fool. Was I a fool? Well, perhaps so. But it's all over now, quite over. Will you have one of these delicious ripe olives? Thanks, I don't mind if I do. Yes, Celeste was a beautiful woman. Almost too beautiful, if you will overlook the cliché. But why, why do I say almost? Well, she was too beautiful. Uh, no offense, I hope. Oh, no offense, James. I should have known she'd lead me a cruel pace when I married her. I could have told you that, Hillary. Ah, yes, but we didn't know each other then, did we? Our friendship has enjoyed a sudden blossoming. Short reckonings make long friends, eh, James? 
I wouldn't know about that. James, don't look so solemn. Now, try some of this vintage wine, Royal Amontillado, Silero, 1851. You can't refuse. Come, have you no respect for years? Well, just a drop. I, I, I have work before me. Uh, that's enough, thanks. To us, James. To us. Ah, that warms a man's soul and sharpens his appetite. Now then, suppose we look into this roast guinea and I'll wonder if we couldn't do better at carriages or the Barclay. How does it go with you? Mm, tastes pretty good. Pretty good. It's a masterpiece. You know, there's a limit to conservatism and a bottom to understatement. Pretty good. Good heavens, man. Uh, if you'd been a little more conservative, we wouldn't be... I know. I've lived in cautiously, dangerously. So did Celeste. We clashed. Disaster, that's all. You were too hasty, too hot-headed. Perhaps. But I know I did the right thing. I know it. You think I did right, don't you? I... I can't answer that question. You ought to understand that, Hillary. But I know what's in your mind, and I'm satisfied. Friends. Well, I wonder just how grateful we should be to them for their good intentions that somehow go wrong. What do you mean? Well, there was Monty Brewer. He was a good friend, I'm sure. He meant well enough. And his own... Irreproachable honesty couldn't let him see a friend of his dishonored. Oh, that's not the word, Hillary, and you know it. She made a fool of you, and I don't see how your honor was affected. You're making excuses, and it's not <laughs> like you. <laughs> you know men, James, that's plain. A little more wine. No, 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 I've had enough, thanks. In all things moderation, eh? Ah, uh, where were we? Our friendship and the evils appertaining thereto. Monty Brewer's my friend. If he hadn't been so blindly loyal to me, I'd never have learned about Jason Holt and my wife, now would I? Oh, those things come into the light one way or another. Yes, yes, I suppose so. For example, I knew that Celeste hadn't loved me for a long time. You loved her, though. Naturally, naturally. Well, that explains a lot of things, but it doesn't justify anything. James, I'm not a vicious man, am I? No, you're a good man. We all know I that. I loved Celeste, and I know she didn't love me any longer, but I trusted her, and she was false. Oh, what's the good, Hillary? It's all over now. Yes, yes, quite over. But she was wrong. She was evil. So I killed her. I'm a simple man and a just one, and I can't hold with murder. But treachery, James, the blackest treachery. Civilized men don't walk into cafes to murder a wife and her companion to revenge treachery. But I did. And even with fury blowing hot in my brain, I loved her. She never saw the gun. She died beautifully. Sweet, dark wine. And a smile on her lips. You can't get away with murder, Hillary. You just can't get away with it, that's all. <laughs> so be it. I remember how I was amused by those fearsome posters the law issued in its war on crime. You know, a gunman clutching a still smoking revolver in his hand, cowering against the stone wall. And over him looms the gigantic shadow of a policeman with avenging arms upraised. I believe the caption read, You can't win. You are in the shadow of the law. <laughs> oh, well. Try some of the salad niçoise. I, I don't think I care for any. I don't feel like much of anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'm glad you asked me to dinner, and it's an honor, really, but... but you I... can't reconcile that Puritan soul of yours to dinner with a murderer. Is that it? Oh, no, no, no. Can't you understand? I, I'm i in an uncomfortable situation, and if you weren't such a cold-blooded fish, you'd appreciate how I feel about it, about this thing. I'm sorry, James. Let's not quarrel now. Bear with me a while longer. Bear with you? With you? You don't seem to be staggering under any cross. Now, you mustn't crack now, James. Easy, does it? You see, things aren't always what they seem. Eternity, death. Night, the true state of a man's soul. They seem one thing when they may very well be another. I mentioned night, James. What would you say is the shape of darkness? The shape of darkness? The shape? Yes. It has a shape, you know. Oh, I know what you think. Night, a vast spreading formless thing, the great shadow, the sable cloak of darkness, all that fanciful nonsense. But night has form and design. I don't know what you're talking about. The sun shines on one side of the earth, James, and there is day. But on the other side, the earth sleeps in her own shadow. A shadow stretching far, far into space, away from the world. And the form of that gigantic shadow is a cone. And so, what? Nothing. 
Except that things are not always what they seem, or that mystery is a word we use to hide our shame of ignorance. Such is the shape of darkness, such is the form of formless night. More coffee, James, and apple pie. You know, the, the simplicity of apple pie amid all this splendor of exotic food. It is. It's getting late, Hillary. Then light, light up a cigar with me. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. Good, good evening. evening. How, how are you? Well, we may consider dinner at an end. Everything was perfect, James. I congratulate you. Anything at all. Anything at all. You've been very good. I wonder if you could uh, spare half a dollar, James. I'm temporarily embarrassed. Half dollar? I... Yeah, yeah, certainly. Thank you. A poor bois for the waiter. They'll poison you with their eyes if you don't leave them a tip. It's time, Hillary. Yes. Will you shake hands with me? Of course. I... I'm sorry about this, Hillary. Awfully sorry. It's quite all right. It's your duty. So goodbye, warden. Oh, by the way, you can collect the half dollar from my estate. Goodbye. Good luck. Thank you, Warden. Solved is the mystery of the shape of darkness. Who fears a cone? A geometrical pattern drawn in space. It may be, too, the death and eternity. I'm ready, Father Gabriel. You will have courage, my son. I will have courage, Father. Remember not, O oh Lord, we beseech thee, the sins of his youth, nor his ignorance. But according to thy great mercy, be mindful of him in the greatness of thy glory. Delicta juventutis et ignorantia meus, pisimus ne memineris domine, sed secundum magnam misericordiam tuam. Memor. W.E.A.F., New York. The Royal Desserts Hour, Act Two, in which we may reasonably expect to run into Johnny and George, Helen Howe, Irving Caesar with his popular and lilting songs of safety for children, and quite suddenly, Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou Barry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, my, what a cheerful little voice. You certainly sound happy this evening, Betty Lou. I am, because my teacher told me she said the way to be happy was to do something for someone, so I did, and so I am. So there, too. <laughs> you you did something for someone? Yes, for my daddy, only he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> I cleaned his watch for him. <laughs> you cleaned your daddy's watch? Yes, I heard Mommy, I heard Daddy tell Mommy that it had to be clean, so today I put it in my dolly's wash tub and I washed it for him, and good, too. <laughs> you washed your father's good gold watch? Yes, and when, it, when I finished, it shined like everything, too. Well, Betty Lou, I know that you meant very well, but don't you think that perhaps you did something you shouldn't have done? Well, I think maybe after I washed it, I shouldn't have run it through the ringer. <laughs> I see. Well, you certainly were thorough. Yes, that's what my granddaddy said, too. Oh, he did? Oh, say, by the way, how is your granddaddy? You know, I go fishing with him, and he catches two fish to my one. Oh, yes. Granddaddy says that he comes from a long line of fishermen, too. <laughs> well, I don't doubt it. You know, I always thought that he fibbed about the size of the fish he was catching. That is, until he bought a pair of scales and started weighing them for me. The scales proved that he was right. Every fish weighs just, well, he said, weighs just what he said it did. Oh, yes, but you know, Mr. Tommy, an awful funny thing happened with those scales. A funny thing happened? What was that? Well, you remember that brand-new baby that next door that was born next door? Yes. 
Well, they weighed him on Granddaddy's scales, and he weighed 47 pounds. <laughs> well, well, proving, Betty Lou, that nobody can tell fibs without someday getting caught. Yes, and people who tell fibs can't go to heaven, can they? Well, I've heard it said they can. Well, did you ever tell a fib, Mr. Tommy? Yes, Betty Lou, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I have told a few. Oh, dear me. And has Mr. Valley and Mr. Matt and me and all the men in the band? Well, I'm afraid they've told at least a couple, Betty. And all the people who listen over the radio? Well, I guess all of them have told a fib at some time or other. Then none of them can go to heaven, huh? Well, not if what I've heard is true. But why? Oh, nothing. Only isn't it going to be awful lonesome up there for poor George Washington, too? <laughs> Well, don't you worry about George Washington, Betty Lou. Just be sure that you don't tell any fibs, for fibbing is very wrong. Well, if you tell one to keep someone out of an awful lot of trouble, is it wrong? Well, just how do you mean? Well, this morning my mommy asked me if I knew who broke her $25 bottle of perfume. Her $25 bottle of perfume? Yes, and I knew my baby brother threw it on the floor and smashed it to pieces. But I said I didn't know anything about it, so there, too. Well... I think it was rather noble of you to fib to protect your little brother. Did you do it because you loved him? No, I did it because I gave him the bottle to play with. <laughs> I see, but you didn't get in any, in any wrong yourself for once. I think you deserve the congratulations of our official troubleshooter, Betty Lou. Irving Caesar, would you please come out here? Hello, Betty Lou. So for once, you've kept yourself out of trouble. Well, yes, I did almost, except... Uh... Except what? Well, except when I was leaning out of the upstairs window hollering at little Bobby. That's when my new shoes fell out. Your new shoes fell out? Did they hit somebody? No, but they fell in the rain barrel and was full of water, too. And Mommy was scared something awful, too. The Mommy was frightened? Yes, because they made such a big splash. But why did your little shoes make such a big splash? I guess because when they fell in the rain barrel, I had them on. <laughs> Don't you? I, I certainly do. And if you want to be sure you'll never fall out another window or, or into another rain barrel, just listen to this. It's wise to have the windows open when the days are fair. For only through an open window can you get fresh air. But when you're near the window, remember where you're standing. Or you may be reminded by a most unhappy landing. When you stand at the window, here is how to do it. Find something to cling to and keep on clinging to it. When you look out and want to shout to someone in the yard, remember to be careful, cause the ground is very hard. I watched him from the window when Mr. Tommy goes out too. And though my hand keeps waving, I never stick my nose out. Or like a dunce, I fell at once, which made me black and blue too. And everybody calls me Humpty Dumpty Betty Lou, too. Now I know why they call you Humpty Dumpty Betty Lou. I'm sure all the mothers and fathers listening will want to teach their children this safety lesson. And here is how to get Irving Caesar's song of safety for their children to learn. To receive your copy of the song, Leaning Out of Windows... Just cut the front from any package of royal desserts, gelatin or pudding, any flavor, and mail it to us with only 10 cents. The song is full sheet music size, complete words and music for the piano. The sort of music which sells for 35 cents in the stores. Send for your copy before next Thursday. And for good measure, we will include a set of brilliantly colored cutouts showing... Showing me, Betty Lou Berry at a Mother Goose party, too. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and did you have a good time, Betty Lou? Oh, and you can see that I did, Mr. Mac and me. There's the cake and a box of candy and a snapper right on the cutouts. And a donkey game, too. And three pretty costumes. 
All that and the valuable song of safety leaning out of windows for a single package front from any royal dessert and only 10 cents. Address Royal Desserts, 420 Lexington Avenue, 420 Lexington Avenue, New York City. So join the thousands who are helping to keep their children safe by teaching them Irving Caesar's famous songs of safety. Right before next Thursday, saying you want this song, Leaning Out of Windows. Buy Royal Desserts and send for your song tomorrow. Johnny and George, from Harlem, by way of 52nd Street, dens, swing dens. Two coffee-colored lads who are regarded by cats and alligators alike as a pair of extremely mean vipers. To desert the swing vernacular, which is growing pretty threadbare anyway, Johnny and George sing and play a very good, popular song. For example, the standard but ever-fascinating St. Louis Blues. I hate to see that evening sun go down. I hate to see that evening sun go down. Cause my baby is gonna leave this town. Now if I'm feeling tomorrow just like I feel today. If I'm feeling tomorrow like I feel today. Gonna pack up my trunk and make my getaway. St. Louis woman with a diamond ring St. Louis woman with a diamond ring Lead me around Around, around, around Fire ravens swing Lordy, 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 lordy Fly, 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 fly,
Johnny and George have at least one claim to immortal fame. They introduced by a mere bis to shame to the Broadway night world. I think that sufficient time has elapsed since Bymere had reached its peak to permit a dispassionate, unemotional survey of its origin. According to a scholarly research conducted by Life magazine, this pernicious chant was composed by Sholem Secunda in 1932, and eventually a copy found its way to the Grossinger Hotel in the Catskill Mountains. Mrs. Jenny Grossinger, uh, Grossinger proprietor. Mrs. Grossinger hired Johnny and George to entertain her guests, taught them the song in Yiddish. Time passed. Johnny and George prospered, deserted the resort circuit for the yacht club on 52nd Street. The rest is history. And here is the song in Yiddish and in English. My just a shame. My by mir bist du schön stehen bei mir bist du it bei mir hast du it bei mir bist du tired of Du schöne Boy, es haben schön gewollt noch mit mir und von der ganzen Welt hab ich neues geklippen dir. Bei mir bist du schön, bei mir hast du kein, bei mir bist du schön, bist du Bist du schön, bei mir hast du kein, bei mir bist du schönster in der Welt. Oh, Nacki Nacki, sage bei mir bist du git, bei mir hast du wit, bei mir bist du teurer als ein Geld. Wo schöne Boje haben schön, gehen bald mit mir, und von der ganzen Welt hab ich neues geklippen dir, aber mir bist du schön. Bei mir hast du kein, bei mir bist du schönster in der Welt. Bei mir bist du schön, ja, ja, ja. please let me explain. Ja, 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 bei mir ja, ja. bist du schön, wie du kein. Bei mir bist du schön, wie du kein. Bei mir bist du schön, wie du kein. To me, you're the fairest in the land. I could say, Bella, Bella, even say Bumba, each language only helps me say how bad you are by me. How can I explain it? So kiss me and say you understand. table near the band, a small one, some cigarettes, a drink, yes, a tall one, and a waiter I could use, a chaser for my blues. Tonight, I mustn't think of her, music, maestro, please. Tonight, tonight I must forget how much I need her 
So, Mr. Leader, play. Oh, play your lilting melodies, ragtime, jazz time, swing. Any old thing to help me ease the pain that solitude can bring. She used to like waltzes, so please don't play a waltz. She danced divinely. And I loved her so, but there I go tonight. I mustn't think of her no more. Memory, swing on tonight. I must. Forget a music, maestro, please. Presenting Miss Helen Howe, who ranks with Ruth Draper and Cornelia Otis Skinner in the top three among practitioners of the art of character monologue. Like Miss Draper and Miss Skinner, Miss Howe often takes as her target the feather-headed matron Americana, the type immortalized in a New Yorker cartoon depicting the lady who summoned a porter in Grand Central Station by yelling, Oh, Redskin! <coughs> Tonight, Miss Howe shows us a variant of the type. To be specific, a suburban matron taking a ski lesson in a New York department store. She calls the sketch Borax Slalom. Miss Howe. The scene is laid at an artificial ski slide at Saks Macy, somewhere between the draperies and photographic supplies. Enter Mrs. East Orange, who addresses the instructor as follows. Uh, pardon me, young feller. I presume that you were the ski instructor. Uh, the uh, young lady in the locker room told me to step down. I'd find you right here at the slide. Say, but you got it fixed up awfully cute here. My, doesn't that borax glisten under the electric light just same as though it was snow in the sunshine. And what a stunning mountain you've got there. Now, my bump of locality isn't very good. Am I right that on the other side of that mountain peak is the yard goods? <laughs> Well, then that's where Etta Stringer is right now. That's my girlfriend, Mrs. George P. Stringer. Her husband works in underwear out of Newark, so she come in to choose some samples for drapes. Uh, does uh, that represent any particular range? Uh, Mount Blanc, you don't say. Oh, is that right? I thought you were native the moment I laid eyes on you. Uh, have you been in our country long? <laughs> Up to Lake Placid. Now, isn't that a coincidence? I had a brother-in-law of mine dislocated his jawbone up there. He said it was lovely. <laughs> uh, then uh, you went and taught at Wanamaker's, didn't you? Oh, uh, that's what I understood. Uh, which did you prefer, Wanamaker's or the Owl? <laughs> yeah, that's right, too. Of course, they are different. Still and all, you get the more regular climate there in Wanamaker's. Well, I certainly think it's awfully nice in this store here. And now, if you would just uh, put the skis down, and I'll step right onto them. Look here, young feller, I might as well call you by your first name. What is it? Hands. That's an awfully cute name. Uh, just put them down there, hands, and I'll step onto them. Say, that's something I never realized. I never knew there was a right and a left foot. I thought that they were more like oars, that you could take them in either hand or... <laughs> either foot. And now I'll just uh, lean on your shoulder so, hands, while you adjust uh, and put it onto my foot. 
No, I'm not an oars woman myself, Hans, but my hubby is. At least he's a very great athlete. That's why I'm picking up skiing, because every single weekend he goes off on one of these snow trains and leaves me behind. So I just figured that I'd sneak off by myself without saying a word to him and take lessons, you see. So then the next time he gets on one of those trains, he'll look up and find me aboard. Can't you just see his face? <laughs> Well, that's just it, you see, Hans. I feel that it's here to stay, this skiing. Now, you take the class of people that does it, you see. That's the point. Now, Mrs. Ralph Edger, out where I live, well, Mrs. Edger is very socially prominent out there. Well, Mrs. Edger is just a wonderful skier. She has been three months in our local hospital with a fractured hip. <laughs> and a report on her condition every week in the social column. Yes, well, that's just it, you see. Uh, and uh, now, Hans, if you just get on with the lesson, if you just don't mind, I'm going to keep my pocketbook right here over my arm. I don't like, uh, uh, you know, I just feel more comfortable with it right here. You just imagine me without it, Hans. Yes, a kick turn. All righty, just forever you say. Uh-huh. Yes, I'll try to do just the same as you do. Uh-huh, now there we are. The right pole by the front of the left ski. And the left pole behind in the middle, or in the middle behind. And <laughs> hands, I'm never going to be able to lift this ski right off the snow. There, look, I've done it. Hands, does this look normal to you? Well, my right foot's going one way, my left foot's going the other way. Which way do I go? <laughs> Well, will you look at that? It turned me right around. Well, say, isn't that the cutest thing? And now, say, listen, what would I do if I was wanting to go, want to go straight ahead and not turn around at all? Uh-huh. Yes, I'll follow right after you. Uh-huh. Down go the knees and out go the ski pole. Yes. Well, it's just in nature for that to go out, too. <laughs> Well, now, why do you think it is that I look so different from the way you look? You know what I figure the trouble is, Hans? I believe it's on account of my girdle. I believe, I believe I'm too tightly corseted. Now, that's two things you've taught me already. When I go in that snow train, I'm going to leave behind my pocketbook and my girdle. I don't mean I'm going to leave behind in the snow train, but I'm going to leave behind before I even get on the snow train. <laughs> oh, my sake, you don't want me to go way up the top of that slide. Say, I'll never get there without I go on my knees with you pushing me behind hands. Hands and knees, huh? <laughs> oh, my. Seems sort of hard on the ankles, doesn't it? Ooh. Oh. There we are at the top, and say what a lovely view you get. The kitchenware on one side, and the, uh, the millinery on the other, and an out thrown in. Oh, say, there's that little hat you've been running in your ad there, with a nest of robins on the top, and the mother bird feeding its young. <laughs> and as I live and breathe, there's Etta Stringer. Oh, Etta, can you see me? Well, you don't want me to go down that slide all by myself. Why, hands first thing you know, I'll crack my head open. Say, Etta, do you hear what he says? Well, I believe if it's the last thing I do, I'll try it. And if I get myself smashed up, it's a ski accident, isn't it? And there's no reason it shouldn't land me in the social columns. But, Etta, look here. If anyone asks you where it happened, you tell them it happened on snow. Don't you forget, Etta Stringer, you never heard the word Borax. Trail! <laughs> This week, grocers everywhere are recommending... Send tomorrow for your copy of this song of safety, Leaning Out of Windows. It may save you many hours of anxiety. Specify that you want this song, and the Betty Lou cutouts will be included. Send only one package front from Royal Desserts, any flavor, and only 10 cents to Royal Desserts, 420 Lexington Avenue, New York City. Wise to have the windows open when the days are fair. 
For only through an open window can you get fresh air. But when you're near the window, remember where you're standing. For you may be reminded by a most unhappy landing. When you stand at the window, here is how to do it. Find something to cling to and keep on clinging to it. When you look out and want to shout to someone in the yard, remember to be careful, cause the ground is very hard. Whoa! Next week, more important and interesting people, more music, laughs, and drama in great variety. Our company next Thursday will be headed by Frank Craven, star of the Pulitzer Prize winning play, Our Town. The Valley Company continues on at the Hotel Astor Roof. This is Rudy Valley bidding you all good night. You stand at the window, here is how to do it.